presenting me. So my name is Tuba. I'm the founder and CEO of Amoeba AI. We're an agentic AI data scientist that's built on a cognitive AI stack. By background, I myself am a data scientist. Um, I'm an alum of MIT. Um, prior to that, I was the VP of product and AI at a bunch of companies in the Silicon Valley. And prior to that, the World Economic Forum. Um, umbrella term, I'm a geek. So you'll hear a lot of geeky things from me today. Um, I'm passing you a button. Um, hi everyone, my name is Tatiana. I run an accelerator for FIS Global. Um, we select up to 10 companies a year and right now we're in the middle of our current cohort. I'm Nick Adams, I'm uh, one of the founders at Differential Ventures here in New York. We're uh, basically an enterprise AI and data focused seed fund. Uh, from a technical perspective, agents basically refers to autonomous AI systems that are working in the background to enable all kinds of workflows, etc. Where we see it being conflated a lot is with chatbots and co-pilots. Um, both of those are like augmenting humans. This is meant to operate autonomously in the background. Change management is, is key. Uh, <laughs> you know, we've all, as investors, as, as operators, like we've all seen, you know, the best technology does not always win. It just doesn't meet customers where they are. You don't understand the human part of, of onboarding them. Um, and I think the other part is like AI has always suffered from the 100% fallacy. And I think we, I think venture capitalists are probably the, the worst about this is like overselling what AI and what, what different parts of, of AI in the tech stack can do today um, creates, I think, disillusionment when it's not, you know, I snap my fingers or like press a button and everything happens automatically forever going forward. It's like, what is the use case that makes sense at this point of time? the values, the rescue you're taking versus the value is going to give you. And I think those two things together are really the starting point of what makes sense. What advice could you give, you know, some of the early stage founders in the audience who are thinking about, you know, approaching an enterprise? Like what needs to be true before approaching those conversations? I think the most impactful, impactful conversations come from the point of understanding how a certain enterprise works. And I think when you come from that position of I'm learning, I'm looking to educate myself to then be better able to support, we find a lot of ability to have the right conversation. Having to have a strong champion takes time. You have to build trust with your champion. You have to make sure that you know you have an understanding of their prices and their own challenges before you are able to actually go and propose a solution. I think for the founders in the room, a couple of things. One, set aside longer than you think you would. Even yes. a 90 day POC I is like probably like six months at this point. Second, it pays to be proactive about some of the data practices that you can put up front. Yes. You're almost always going to run into an AI committee or a buying committee in enterprises. I found it useful to be very proactive about, you know, these are the practices we have in place. Almost think about it as like a pre RFP that you can fill and send out that's standardized. And like at the end of the day, I think even approaching use cases, I would I would say get creative. Like for us, like we got into enterprises by looking at enterprises that were advertising for data science positions and say like, hey, wouldn't you like to have a tool instead of that? That like the start of the conversation needs to be at something that you know hooks at a pinpoint that they're actually feeling exactly um, yeah. versus just like oh this is a solution that might inc like incrementally like give you some sort of benefit. If you can kind of get to the problem segment and like why you're different, it really helps understand for us because otherwise, if we if you're not clear with that, like we either have to do the research or we don't do the research. It's one of the two. This age of implementing enterprise technology and AI for companies, the, the sales cycle, the implementation process, and and customer support looks a lot more like what I did in 2003 and 2004 than it did in 2016. When people try to differentiate, like they pitch in a certain way. And what becomes really impactful or memorable, so to speak, is like, what is the day in the life of that problem that you're solving? Like, tell us a story of like, exactly what I would look like versus like a demo of a solution. Tuba, for founders who are thinking about starting to sell into the enterprise or identifying early customers, design partners, who to run POCs with, you're obviously looking maybe for people who are hiring data scientists or who are actively expressing that this is types of technology that they're using. How are you going about and determining who are the right folks to engage or even as you're having some of those initial discovery conversations as Tatiana outlined, 
you know, your own criteria of evaluating whether this person is going to be a potentially good fit or partner for you? Um, I think it's a little bit of experimentation, but the one thing I would say is like, you want the relationship to feel symbiotic and not parasitic, essentially, because they, like reaching out to someone cold and saying, can you make an introduction? Like one, you have to appeal to their humanity. Like what is it, what's in it for them as well? And like make a better case for yourself. As technologists, it's really hard to humanize ourselves sometimes. I'll be the first one to admit that, but essentially like appeal to a problem that they're facing and like try to talk about it with some sense of credibility. Why do you deserve to be in the room to talk about that problem and to be able to solve that problem? And then afterwards, there is like this thing called aftercare for your for your um, evangelist in the company as well, where you have to make sure you are protecting that evangelist. We ran into that um, quite a lot where, you know, our evangelist was like, I'm ready to go, this is great, I wanna start a POC, did not maybe get the right levels of approval and then because it's a data product, a data product or data problem, it, they run into problems with their own organization. So you're doing a lot of like nurturing in this, of helping kind of guide people through the process as well, making sure that they feel, you know, prepared to be able to advocate and champion for you. Are there any like tips that you have found that you would share with this group? I would say literally treat them like you're growing bacteria in a petri dish, essentially, <laughs> carefully nurture like make sure you're sustaining the relationship and again like appeal the best evangelists best relationships are formed when there is a human connection if you're not sitting inside the organization it's very hard to kind of understand how that organization operates so like that evangelist is essentially your foot in the door that way as well so you're trying to learn as much as you can from them people don't even ask like is this the right type they want to pitch yes yeah. like you're wasting your time if this is not the right time ask the question like you don't want to take like the time that you have it's limited like go and like find the person that has this priority right now versus being so obsessed about like oh i'm gonna pitch to this company and like we you know we're gonna have next steps and the next step is like a pitch with more people but if this is not the right time it doesn't matter the fact that you're an ai company today will not mean shit in three years nobody's like so like it's like saying you're a blockchain company, you know, 2017. Nobody cares. Like, get the job done, solve the problem. And whether you're AI, whether you're SaaS, whether you're on-prem, like, it doesn't really matter. Just looking to solve a, a pain point. And that, there's a deeper, darker tech conversation that will happen somewhere in the process. But, like, I wouldn't open with that. So, like, restructure that to a very different pitch that's more business-oriented. And it's it's been much more successful. I think if you're, like, dead set on going to the enterprise, closing six, seven figure uh, contracts over time. First of all, you just have to have old school frameworks of like budget authority, immediate timing, like that, that stuff. And Miller Hyman, like who's your who's your champion? Who's gonna sign off on this thing? Who are the kind of other influences that are gonna come into play? Like just basics, frameworks of how to sell and, and implement a project. And then think about, you know, navigate your way through the, the maze of a large company to like where you can implement one thing that you do really, really well and relentlessly qualify the opportunity. What advice do you give people of assessing? Like, does it make sense to pursue those larger contracts to begin with? Or, hey, should I try to go, you know, down market, sell to maybe a digital health clinic and, and start with something that's a little bit smaller, get a quick win on the board, prove out some stuff, and then move up market? I mean, at the, at the seed stage, um, unless it's a massive seed round, which we don't like anyway, we strongly discourage and stay away from investments that are focused on like selling into large financial services. It's just, you need too much, too much runway, too much time, just basics of getting through cybersecurity stuff. A small company is, you know, 12 months minimum. Uh, so if you're, if you're not prepared for that, realistically, it's two years. Uh, if you don't have the runway and the team and, and everything else, like you know, forget it. It's just, it's a, it's a death sentence. Don't talk about your deep tech. They don't care. Like when I talk about neural nets, people's eyes glaze over um, in that sense. They care about what is it doing for me. And in that same vein, if you go in and say, I can solve all of your go to market problems with this one product, they also look at you like you're batshit crazy, right? So you want to be able to solve like one problem for them really, really well. You also have to think about it in terms of being a little bit more turnkey. Meaning you can't tell them, okay, six months from now, you're going to start seeing value from this product. You have to be able to kind of design your POC in a way where they start to see some advantage based on your product within the first like 
couple of weeks, or even as early as like in the first week, there should be some insight that they're getting from a project they weren't getting before. And that's the thing that hooks them and keeps them on the POC. As an early stage investor, how are you kind of sussing out the signal from the noise or when you're evaluating companies who are building agentic AI tools, what are you looking for and how they're presenting their vision and, and the potential? What are some of those things that you're, you're assessing? Uh, you know, I think um, this age of enterprise technology is exponentially more complex than the last generation of like code, compute, maybe you push it to the cloud, maybe you push it on-prem, whatever. Like, code compute over and over again. The process of doing, collecting the data, managing it, normalizing it, you know, building and training a, a model, uh, pushing that into production, monitoring those models and the performance of them over time because they change um, is really hard. And if uh, your startup team that doesn't have that experience, um, I don't, you have to find it <laughs> because I, I don't think there's a way to be successful in this world without really understanding what's going on inside of um, any model that you deploy. Each, each model to me is like a, a, a new product, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and we see a lot of founders who are you know, rightfully excited about large language models and, and what they can do um, and trying to build on top of them, but there's very little defensibility to that in a lot of ways. And if you don't understand and frankly, none of us understand what's going on inside of OpenAI or Anthropic or others for the most part. It's gonna be really hard to adjust and modify your product and your roadmap over time as the performance of these models changes and, and um, I would say degrades, uh, which is just a, a reality of how these large language models are built and, and deployed. When we do have kind of widespread adoption, what are you excited for about the potential of AI agents? Um, can I say sentient beings though? <laughs> okay. um, essentially, I think I'm excited for if most of these workflows were automated, what do we as humans get to focus on and what does business look like at that point? Uh, there's a long way to get there, I will say that. The world will change in the next few years and I think what we get to do with all of the time that we would potentially have would be really interesting. I feel like people work so much, but like how much of that is actual thinking time and like really understanding of what's impactful versus doing what you know the steps you have to do in order to get your job done I mean I still remember a time before email like oh. what could be beyond that <laughs> <laughs> I, I do and have had lots of concerns around just um I don't know if people need jobs <laughs> and, and I think it's good for people to be out there and doing stuff and I don't want to ride in a cab that is, you know, doesn't have a driver in it. I, I, I don't want a cab driver there. I want that person to have a job and I want somebody there. It's just personal preference. I think people need reasons to um, do things um, and uh, get out of bed in the morning. So I have my I have my concerns. I'm, I'm excited about um, kind of some of the, you know, easier repetitive tasks that we can automate and be more, you know, thoughtful and, um, Doing. but I think there's a, a big, shift in society needs to happen um, that I don't quite see there yet, um, combined with some of our other horrible things that go on like social media. Um, <laughs> uh, I think there's just a lot of these happen just in education and training and retraining people to um, fill the holes that will pop up in, in the economy. Well, thanks so much everyone for joining us. Really appreciate all of our wonderful panelists. Let's give them a nice round of applause.